and then comparing that capacity number that we come up with, both housing units and population and employment with, with that forecast number. And so comparing it against the interjurisdictional uh, alternative, what we came up with was that we're about 2,000 housing units shy of meeting that capacity. Um, there's just under 36, uh, just under 36,000 people forecast, and we have enough uh, capacity based on our analysis to accommodate um, about 32,000. So roughly 4,000 people, just under 4,000, and uh, that's we we roughly, depending on the mix of single family and multifamily, accommodate somewhere around two persons per household. So it comes out to about 2,000 housing units. So how do we get there? How do we, how do we make up a difference of 2,000 housing units? And there's a, there's a variety of ways to get there. Um, in the, the 2006 comprehensive plan, there were several um, alternatives that were examined in the EIS for that plan. Uh, in a nutshell, there's, the, of course, the no-action alternative, which doesn't really accomplish the goal there. And then there's the option of, of accommodating all the growth through infill. You can accommodate all the growth through expansion or you can do some combination of the two, um, add some land to the UGA or um, accommodate it through infill, through land use change and that kind of thing. So the two, th there were two primary ways that we looked at um, initially trying to make up that 2,000 housing unit difference just to provide some, um, some options for you folks to, to look at and, and there are certainly other ways to get there as well. Um, one of them was to look at the urban villages that were identified in the 2006 comp plan that we have not yet master planned, and then to see if there were any additional areas that, that were obvious ones that we missed last time around. And so if you look at this map, what you can see are um, the uh, pink areas are the master planned areas that we've, we've uh, are calling urban villages and that we've actually got uh, an, an estimate for their development capacity because they've been master planned and we've looked at the patterns of ownership and development capacity and um, the development regulations that have been adopted for those and we can come up with a, a reasonable guess as to how they might develop. So Fairhaven, Samish Way, the waterfront, downtown, Old Town, the Fountain District, and we're including Barclay Village in the list because it was in the 2006 comp plan and while we don't necessarily call it an urban village in our code, it's identified as an urban development center, has a lot of similar rules and regulations to an urban village, and really to a lot of, people, um, a lot of people's eyes, it really functions that way. And um, so those are identified in pink. The uh, green kind of fuzzy blobs that you see here are the other four areas we identified, three of which, um, Cordata, the Birchwood Northwest area, and Lakeway and Lincoln, were identified in the last comp plan as potential urban villages, but like I said, we, we have not master planned them yet, so we, don't, we hadn't generated hard numbers for them. And then another one that really kind of fell through the process or just fell through the cracks through our, um, the last comp plan was the uh, James Street corridor from Alabama south to about Kentucky Street, um, which when you think about it for, for, for a lot of people, it, it's kind of an obvious one. There's a lot of, a lot of kind of reinvestment going on in that corridor. It's on a, it's on a high frequency transit route, um, there's a lot of activity there, and, and there is some definite redevelopment potential. So, um, so looking at those areas, um, th th that's an alternative, is to look at those and to apply the uh, established uh, potential boundaries around those and to apply the same kinds of development um, floor area ratios and um, estimates that we have for the other established urban villages, and we can come up with numbers for those that that would provide us some guidance as to whether, um, whether they can get us uh, a good chunk of that 2,000 housing units we're looking for. And then another, another way of getting there, or a, a way to, to complement the urban villages, would be to look at our, our uh, recently annexed areas and also the remaining urban growth area. And um, you're probably familiar with the URMX zoning that the county has established in the urban growth area. And um, what you see here in yellow are the, the areas that are either currently zoned URMX in the ur urban growth area around the edge of town or in the King Mountain and the, uh, the uh, Meridian neighborhoods, the areas that were rezoned from URMX to a compatible city zoning. And those areas are typically zoned six to 10 units per acre, six to 12, and in some cases, 10 to 24 units per acre. What we've typically done in our land capacity analysis is counted those uh, closer to the six unit or 
the, the lower end of the density range because of past patterns of development. Um, to get to higher densities in those areas requires the use of the TDR program, um, and that really has not been taken advantage of in the past for a variety of reasons. And so, again, trying to be realistic, we've, we've counted capacity at the low end of the spectrum, but, but there's some options there for some policy changes, and maybe we want to look at establishing minimum densities or some kind of a higher, uh, some kind of additional incentive to get to a higher development density there. Um, so that's something to talk about, something to look at in the, in the discussion about how we get those extra housing units. Um, we've run some initial numbers on the vacant land in those areas and going to a mid-range. So if it's a six to 10 range going to like eight units per acre, or if it's a, a six to 12 going to nine units per acre, um, does get us a long way there. We get, we get something like 1,200 housing units throughout the urban growth area. And, uh, and the recently annexed areas, um, in addition to what we're already counting, if, if we went to like a mid-range, if we could establish some, some policy to get us there. And then finally, looking at uh, the idea of expansion. And so um, there's kind of two, two tiers or two steps for expansion. One is to look at uh, the UGA reserve areas, and Bellingham's urban growth area has one UGA reserve, the, the south half of the U Street corridor, which formerly was part of our urban growth area, and in 2009 it was removed. Um, so that would be one option, is to look at reinserting that into our UGA, um, reestablishing the urban levels of zoning there, and that would, that would get us some additional capacity. And then the final option would be looking at an area north of the city, um, and we've looked at the, the uh, county's consultant is examining this area as uh, what they're calling an analysis area. So they're looking at the environmental impacts, the transportation impacts, and a whole variety of other, other factors to see, does it make any sense to expand into those areas or what would be the potential, potential pros and cons of, of doing that? Um, it's all zoned for rural density at this point, but it would mean including it in the urban growth area and then rezoning it to an appropriate density prior to annexation and development. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to consider there. And as you know, you've probably seen maps of the city before with the environmental constraints. It's, it's very uh, green at the north end of the city. There are a lot of stream corridors to cross, a lot of wetlands, a lot of interconnected uh, uh, systems out there. So there are some definite challenges. And it, again, it may or may not make sense to go that direction. So, um, before I hand off to Lisa, I guess what that leaves us with is the multi-jurisdictional resolution is the uh, EIS alternative we would be looking at uh, eventually input from you folks on as to what kinds of, kinds of policy direction you would want us to explore to, um, to make up that 2,000-ish housing unit uh, shortfall that we have. Um, and again, what we've shown here are just a, a few of the ways that we might be able to get there. So. Okay, just to switch gears a little bit, but this helps kind of put things in context, I think. Hopefully you all took the survey. Um, it was a very well received. It was open online from September 15th through October 20th, and we had 1,202 total responses, which I think is really great. Um, I'm just gonna highlight a few of uh, our key questions, and the rest of the results are now on our website at www.cob.org slash comp plan. So if you go there, the full report is on the website. So this question asked, uh, folks to select the three legacies that are most important to them. And what we mean by legacies are the adopted legacies and strategic commitments for the city. They were adopted in 2009 by city council. Um, the three legacies chosen as most important were healthy environment at 57%, vibrant sustainable economy at 55%, and clean safe drinking water at 42%. The next four questions are getting at general growth and development options, which is what Chris just went over with the alternatives. And uh, this first question asks folks, um, what do they think about the statement, don't change anything, I like Bellingham the way it is. 23.2% strongly agreed or agreed, while 
0.4% disagreed or strongly disagreed. The next question said, do you agree with the statement to encourage more infill development? 75% of respondents strongly agreed or agreed, and 16% disagreed or strongly disagreed. The next statement, encourage owners in the urban growth area to annex their properties into the city. 44% strongly agreed or agreed, while 24% disagreed or strongly disagreed. And the last one in this series, uh, expand the boundaries of the urban growth area to include more land that is suitable for future development. 31% strongly agreed or agreed, and 52% disagreed or strongly disagreed. So those are just the questions that I wanted to highlight here tonight. Um, there were also questions uh, on specific infill options like offering incentives in our urban villages, zoning changes, ADUs, um, incentives in, in other areas of town to encourage multifamily where it's zoned for multifamily. Uh, then we also had questions on the potential new urban villages that Chris went over, as well as demographics. And I did want to highlight on the infill option question related to ADUs that 79% of folks strongly agreed or agreed with allowing detached ADUs uh, where there is a primary residence on the site. And 81% agreed to identify properties along bus routes for mixed uses and higher density. So those were just a few other key points on that. So with that, um, that's the end of our presentation. And we did have this open as a public hearing, or advertised as a public hearing, so we want to give folks a chance to speak tonight and answer your questions. Thank you. Any questions from the commission for clarification? If not, then we'll continue on with the um, with the public hearing, and uh, three people have signed up. David McLeod is first, Clayton Petrie, and Darcy Jones. And I imagine that Doug wants to come back and, and sp speak. So um, if you could come up in, in that order, David, Clayton, and Darcy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, just because you're not on the list doesn't mean you can't talk. I'll take up the time. <laughs> nah. Just kidding. Uh, my name's Clayton Petrie. I live in Bellingham. I grew up here. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for holding a hearing on uh, the different ways that Bellingham can, can grow. It's a, a really important step, first step to addressing growth here in Bellingham again. Um, there's, there's a ton of issues, but the one address being addressed tonight is how best to attract population moving into Whatcom County into the Bellingham urban growth area. How do you, how do you get those people to move here instead of out in the county somewhere? Uh, Bellingham did a particularly good job in their first effort in growth management. If you look in our current comp plan, you'll see that uh, about 62% of all people moving to Whatcom County moved into Bellingham. Uh, and it's UGA, um, 95 to 02. Um, about half that many people, or percentage-wise, uh, 08 to 14 did, and the county reports that only about 25% did last year. So we've gone from 62% capture down to about a quarter. Something's got to change um, if we're going to bring those percentages back up. Um, but one of the first things I wanted to mention is that the Bellingham UGA Reserve should be included as part of alternative two, not alternative three. And the reason I say that is if you attended the uh, May 13 Growth Management Coordinating Council meeting, um, the topic was on growth management UGA tools, and Executive Laos explained that the county considers a UGA reserve to be more part of a UGA, the UGA of a city than other areas not holding the reserve status. And the Whatcom County Long Range Planning Manager, Mark Personius, further explained that the compre Whatcom County Comprehensive Plan does not view uh, UGA reserve reinstatement as a UGA expansion. So I think that should be part of alternative two for those reasons. Um, 
The next thing I want to talk about is how the law of supply and demand has not been repealed. It's something that a friend of mine likes to say, uh, and it's, it's very true. Um, Washington State recommends that jurisdictions planning look at what market demands are when they're, when they're planning because, well, I think uh, Commissioner Noah could explain that to you quite well. Um, so what, it, what do newcomers look for when, they cho when they're looking for a place to live? Uh, does that affect Bellingham's to, uh, ability to attract growth into the Bellingham growth area? And uh, you know, what would hyper competition for a housing type with short supply and high demand do to housing affordability, especially in a city that formerly, formally declared a housing affordability emergency under a speci special Washington state law, which we did, uh, I think, two years ago. Um, you, you, you need to look at market demand to figure that out. Um, as you saw in the presentation today, well, the, the information I was using was from the old comp plan, but the information today said that um, our supply is, uh, I think, 22% single family and 78% multifamily. Um, in the old comp plan, it was only 67 and 33, uh, the 33 being single family. And that doesn't really comport with what market demand is. Um, there's been a lot of research on that, some really recent stuff. And um, the vast majority of people are looking for detached single family home. Um, they also, they're more demanding than just that though. They want it located in a walkable community close to schools, stores, and restaurants. Um, think of our really, really popular parts of Bellingham to live, like the Lettered Streets, as a former city council member mentioned, uh, Columbia neighborhood, Sunnyland neighborhood. They're, they're all really awesome parts of Bellingham that are in high demand. Um, and they also did some, some studying on, if they, they said, if you had this walkable community, but it was living in an apartment or a townhome or a condo, would you accept that as a change? And, and people said, no, I would drive out to where I could get my detached home. And, and that's, that's just, people want their lifestyle. And you know, we've kind of seen that in this area over the last uh, number of years. So you probably wonder, well, how, just how strongly do people want that kind of home? And, and the answer is they overwhelmingly choose that. Um, if you look in a packet I gave you earlier on slide four, you can see that people strongly prefer a short commute, easy walk to everyday places like school stores and restaurants. They'll even give up a big yard. They'll give up that half acre lot for a, a little teeny yard that they maybe uh, can put native planting in and never have to mow on. But it, it's also a fact that most people will reject a multifamily, you know, a, an apartment or a condo and just choose a longer commute because they really desire that kind of house. Um, if you look at the numbers on, on those sheets, 76% um, of people will choose to live in a detached home and about 14% choose apartment condominium and 6% duplex, triplex and townhomes. And that's a striking statistic when you look at some of the numbers that were presented to you earlier, which are basically flipped upside down. It's the opposite land supply for what the, mar what the market demands. Um, I think that's a big deal. Um, slide 26 says it well, walking and commute time are key to community preference, but detached housing trumps all. Um, if you look at some of Bellingham's growth problems, one of them is that builders are building single family homes on multifamily zoned land, um, which is a big loss to our, our housing capacity that we count on. And it just shows you how desirable that housing type is. Um, um, okay, I, I, I included some charts. You know, you might say, well, did Bellingham really capture two thirds of all the growth before? I mean, is that possible or close to it? And so I, I gave you a, uh, couple of excerpts from the current comprehensive plan of Bellingham and some staff work that Whatcom County used in the last process and in a hearings board case in a quasi-legal setting. Um, so, you know, Bellingham really needs to look at more than just how many units are there. Um, you guys are the planning commission and we need to look at our planning for, for how this plan fits together with real life. 
You know, what are people, what will people really do? What, what will they accept? What will they give up? You know, maybe we can get seven units on, on an acre with little teeny lots with our cottage housing infill toolkit option. That'd be awesome. Um, in fact, you know, maybe we can have some tiny houses. I don't know if you've seen my Facebook page, Bellingham Tiny. Suzanne uh, Blaze and I set that up. We'd love to see more of that. And uh, the survey shows that a lot of Bellingham people are will willing to accept that kind of uh, additional capacity in Bellingham. Um, I'll wrap this up now. Thank you. Um, so basically, uh, what I'm saying is, is you guys need to find a lot more single family lots in the Bellingham UGA. You might have to add some land, um, probably the reserve area, which I don't think is considered by the county an expansion, and maybe more land than that, I don't know. But it has to be a, a major component of, of the next plan, and I'd like you to consider that when looking at the stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Clayton. Darcy? Hi, Darcy Jones. I'm with Jones Engineers, 4164 Meridian Street in Bellingham. I have to really echo what Clayton's saying. If I understood correctly, we're planning for 22% of the growth in this city for the next 20 years to be single family and 78% to be multifamily over the next 20 years. <laughs> well, I, I can only imagine where the people are going to be moving over the next 20 years, and it's not going to be within the city and its UGA if that's the case. And I think that's a huge mistake. Um, I think that that kind of leads me to the, you know, I'm asking a question, where did the 2,000 dwelling units come from, the, the shortage of 2,000 dwelling units that was presented about a year ago, there was a presentation at the county council using the land capacity analysis at the time, but relying on the same um, population figure from the, uh, the joint resolution of 35,000 so or so. And the projection at that time was we were going to need up 35 to 4,000 new homes, depending on a couple different metrics. But it's been cut in half. And we, I haven't seen the math, so to speak. I think people would like to see how we're coming to that conclusion and if in some of the parameters and, and the single family, multifamily mix has certainly got to be one of the significant parameters in coming to that conclusion. And um, I think there's, there's no doubt some others. And I know the, the city and county staff are doing a diligent job on this to, to do the land capacity, but there are some policy decisions about some significant parameters that get plugged into that program that make a huge difference. I think there's also some issues with some of the setbacks and buffer assumptions um, that, that would lead you to believe there's more land available for development. Um, so yeah, the land capacity analysis we, th we think uh, needs to be aired out on, and reviewed. And um, I also, you know, I'm, I'd like to point, if I could, to alternative to your map. Um, I have a f an old story. I guess I am getting a little older. But back in 1985, I had the luxury of working on the, the urban fringe sub area plan when I was a planning student up at Western. And the paradigm back then, they told us, look for areas in the urban fringe that will accommodate two to four acre lots. That was the paradigm back then. So literally, that's how our original urban fridge sub area was established in the 80s. It turned into UGA under the Growth Management Act was adopted in 1990. So a lot, I'm sincerely telling you, some of these urban growth areas you're looking at that haven't developed since their inception. And we're, we're looking up at Dewey Valley and you know maybe even east of U Street, not not West U Street, but there's, there's some areas that they've been in the UGA forever and they, they, they just haven't developed. They don't want to. They've told the city they don't want to. And, and, and you know, Dewey Valley, we're talking 230 acres of land we're, we're claiming in our land supply that they've already said they don't want to be in the city in general. There's, there's 492 acres being shown to you in the Britain Road area. I'd say at least 75% of that is already developed. It's not going to redevelop. Um, you know, and down 
the, the east side of U Street. You know, there's 260, 70 acres there that we're, we're counting in our books, but again, they've showed no interest in being in the UGA ever. So <clears throat> my theory has been for quite a while, there might be a way to realign the urban growth here to be more efficient. Um, there are areas that are, are really want to grow. They, they have, there's people in this room that own land that want to develop. Um, the, up, up at the north end, I know the Kitech Corporation has land there that they want to develop. They're ready, willing, and able to do it. And able is a big word to nowadays too, you know. We're, we're building homes up at the north end right now and they're selling very well. We, we expect it to continue. So I, I really think when looking at the, you know, alternative two, we might, you, you seriously might look at, you know, taking some of those areas out of the UGA that have just not been interested in becoming part of the city and, and replacing them with a more efficient land that, that can meet a lot of our sustainable growth standards. Um, really quickly, going to alternative three, you know, again, I, I see the orange band around the north end of the city, and I still have to wonder, are, are, some, are, the, are those lands, are they already willing and able to, to be part of the city and to grow? Um, it, some of them I know are, but I, I don't know. It, it, and I think that should be a consideration when running the models and making assumptions that, you know, we're looking at the, the actual, um, property owners' uh, wishes on some of this, too. So, and, and what the market's looking for, and, and I appreciate it, thank you. Thanks, Darcy. Um, next, we'll, we'll have Doug, because I cut him off, eh, if that's okay. All right, thanks. Uh, again, it's Doug Allen, 2950 McLeod Road. So I'm, I'm coming into this uh, relatively new, but I'm, I'm gonna, uh, uh, been working with uh, the neighbor, Birchwood neighborhood and a subgroup up in the McLeod uh, Maplewood area. And so um, I'm not necessarily representing all of, uh, all of those folks, but uh, it's, these are my opinions, but uh, for, for one of the things I think we can all agree to is that uh, in, in the Birchwood neighborhood as, as well as in our subgroup is that we need more green space and we need more trails, um, which include, and green space includes parks. Uh, we're just lagging way behind most of the, the rest of the city uh, for that. And most of our trails, we have a few trails, but they, they don't connect with anything. They're, they're out there, they're little segments, and, and they're nice to have, but they need to be hooked up to something that connects with the rest of the city. Any new development needs to have green space, parks, and trails. We, so that, that's a, a uh, uh, needs to be consistent throughout, regardless of, of uh, what kind of development we have in the future. Looking at the alternatives, um, for alternative one, um, you know, we have, we, it's particularly in the northern part of the Birchwood neighborhood, we have some pretty long lots. Everybody knows that. Uh, some of those have, start to be, uh, have started to be split already. But uh, before we start splitting all those lots up and having more infill, uh, I, to, to do that with the infrastructure that we've got now, including roads and trails and parks, it's just going to be um, uh, um, a bit chaotic. I mean, our road system there, we don't have, tr we don't have sidewalks in most of it, uh, and we don't have street lights. We don't, it's, it's not like neighborhoods. It's more, it feels more rural, and that's how it developed, and that's, I think that's how people envisioned it to be. So that's to, to start infilling all of, those, all of those lots, unless it's planned carefully, it's going to create chaos. So, um, and then as far as the urban village concept, you know, we have, we're doing a lot of work in the, in the Birchwood, um, Alderwood uh, connection there with, with uh, the intersection with Northwest and, and Maplewood and Birchwood. 
Uh, the Birchwood neighborhood has done a lot of work there in cooperation with the city. Uh, so that needs to, that connection needs to be to remain strong. Um, you know, it needs to be if if there's going to be an, a development of that as an urban village, it needs to to have mixed use. Um, and and again, green space, parks, trails, and not just be putting in more apartment complexes. I mean, we have a lot of apartment complexes. We have, we've, we've got a, a, a strong component of infill already in that, particularly in that Maplewood corridor. And, you know, we feel like it's probably time for some other neighborhoods to step up a little bit in that regard. Uh, <clears throat> I, I also support using parts of alternative two, especially where we have existing UGAs to, to take some of the pressure off uh, infill in the city where, where it's going to create uh, unnecessarily uh, undue burden on, on those neighborhoods. And um, again, even, even with alternative three, I feel like if there's planning there so that we have the urban centers, plan growth, plan um, uh, um, urban villages, uh, I think that could also be a way to help get some of our infill. So that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Dad. Next. And anybody who wants to speak, kind of maybe form a line on, on that wall. We promise not to shoot. Hi, good evening. Matt Paskus, 1151 Old Marine Drive. I live in the urban growth area. And, uh, you know, our, our area out there is sort of dying. Um, we live by the airport. And um, what's happening is you're, most of your flights are serving Canadians. And what happens is, um, you know, we all want an airport. I think it would be great. But what's happening, um, this new integrated noise model came out. And they project um, 56 acres by the year 2030 will be uh, encroached by the actual noise, and that's where the, the FAA says, hey, you know, uh, I'm sorry, but there's nothing we can do or we're going to buy you out or mitigate. And so what happens, you're, you're, that airport sitting out there is a lot of great property, and I think with your work, um, I think what you could do is you could, you could ease some of the stress of those homeowners uh, in, the UR, in, in the UGA and around that buffering, that airport. There's beautiful properties out there. So it's going to be up to you to say, hey, you know, port, you know, does our airport have to be this big, even though the FAA says, you know, yeah, you can't really uh, discriminate against an air carrier. But if we knew, if Bellingham knew that majority of the flights are serving Canadians, uh, I have a good friend, Mark Reese, he works for SeaTac, and he said, the only reason Allegiance here is to serve Canadians. And the only reason Alaska's here is to put a legion out of business. So those, are the, so, so those are the things that you guys get to contend with. And I'd sure appreciate if you guys um, get more involved with the port. And, and don't let them say that you know, it's, it's not in your jurisdiction, because it is. Uh, those noise contours and the airport disclosure has already been breached by the INM, 65 decibel level. And so it's going to be up to you to control how that noise contour hits your, your um, your regions or your neighborhoods. I appreciate your time. Thanks. Next. My name is David Cunningham. I um, live on McLeod Road in the Birchwood neighborhood. Um, a couple of things. One of them was on one of the slides there that showed the growth of um, jobs and population in the city. Uh, 30, 35,000 people or 36,000 people and 22,000 jobs, that's like one job for every three people. Now, I understand some of those people are kids, some of them are retired people, etc. But I think uh, what I don't see in there is the looking at the demographics of how are how is the population changing? What's the projected demographic of the change in population in Bellingham? Because my observation is that you, we're getting more and more retired people coming here. And if that's the case, are we really going to create that enough jobs to, um, to are we going to get enough young people here to take the jobs that we're talking about creating? Because if we start creating, we're looking at creating 22,000 jobs, we may not be creating as many jobs as we, um, as many people to take those jobs as we hope to create, and that's going to change a lot of the uh, economics of how the city functions. That's not really what I came up to ask about or talk about, though. Um, the, uh, 
the Birchwood neighborhood, it, to me, one of the attractions of it is it's one of the few affordable neighborhoods that we have where you can get a lot that's not a postage stamp. It's one of the reasons my wife and I bought there. And we lived for nine years out in the county because we could not find something in the city that met our needs. And the Birchwood neighborhood is one of the few places that we could move to. And I would really hate to see the densities changed in such a way that allowed us to create in what what's being called infill. But to me, when you change the the um, square footage required for housing from half an acre, we have a third of an acre, down to a quarter of an acre, or you know whatever is smaller to allow another house on each one of those lots, you have really taken away the quality of that neighborhood that's very important, I think, to a large number of the people who live in that, in that area. So please consider that. I think um, there's a lot to be said for infill. I am a big fan of infill, but as long as it's done in a way that does not um, negate the qualities of that neighborhood that people have bought there for. Um, the other thing I want to say is we live on McLeod between uh, Northwest and Maplewood and we just have this nice roundabout put in at the end out there at the end, Northwest and McLeod and one of the things I don't know if the city really planned on this or thought about it too much but it has really changed the character of the traffic coming through. I don't know what the if there's a counter that's been put out and to see how many cars go through there. But it, the perception is that there are a huge number more cars, I mean a very significant number more cars coming through on the cloud to cut through because now they can make a left turn, they can get across northwest to get to the freeway, they can make a left turn on northwest to go on up to Fred Meyer or wherever, and especially if Costco goes in up there. Um, so that's been, it's kind of one of those unintended consequences. Last year, because the Birchwood Elementary was closed, we had, my wife and I started making a list of all the school buses that go through there that do not drop kids off, but just come through because the roundabout was there and it was so much easier for them to make, <coughs> for, pardon me, for them to make a left turn onto Northwest to get onto the freeway. And we counted 32 buses a day that came through on a street that has no sidewalks and gutters in various different places. I've seen people having to jump off the street to get out of the way of the cars coming through there. So that's another one of those unintended consequences. I don't know if the city thought about the school buses starting to use that, but when I talked to the transportation department at the school district, the lady in charge said that they have to take the easiest route and it really, as long as it's a legal street, they don't really consider the effect on the, on the homeowners on that street. So that was another one of those things that I think is really important to look at, the potential unintended consequences of some of the planning decisions on people that already live in those neighborhoods. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, I've a few different things. First, um, your name, please. Oh, sorry. My name is Isaac Post. I just graduated from Western Washington University, and I'm working uh, off Fraser Street. Um, and um, I live in the Happy Valley neighborhood, and the Happy Valley neighborhood predominantly has no sidewalks. There's a lot of areas in Bellingham that have no sidewalks, and um, what I've noticed is that the difference between uh, South Hill, which is a very, very nice neighborhood, very expensive neighborhood, and Happy Valley is really the matter of about 70 feet in height in one block because there's a bluff that goes up. And that's the only difference between those two neighborhoods is 70 feet of height in that one block. In South Hill, you have these uh, tree-lined uh, streets, very narrow streets uh, with sidewalks along them. Uh, most cars park on the street rather than in the driveway, and you get people who drive slower through those areas. Now you drop down elevation to uh, Happy Valley, and you get wide, 
wide streets, or even if they are skinny streets, no one's parking on them, so it makes them wider. The fact that there's these gutters on either side before you have a sidewalk, if there even is a sidewalk, means that uh, there's no plants or anything to make the street seem smaller, so people drive faster. Um, and it's a lot less fun to walk on because you're either walking, sharing the uh, lane with the car, or if you are lucky enough to have a sidewalk, uh, there's a giant ditch uh, with very few pedestrian access points to go from that area to where you need to go. So it's normally a sidewalk is only on one side of the street. 21st Street is a very, very busy street, has a sidewalk on only one side all the way down. Um, then we have uh, certain situations where, um, actually I'll go into that team bit, but first uh, when, uh, I forget his name, he was just talking about jobs in uh, Bellingham, I feel that there could be a much stronger integration between Western Washington University and um, the local companies in Bellingham and the area to try to foster um, more people from uh, Western graduating and getting jobs in our local area rather than us serve Bellingham s serving as a temporary home for so many students. I really wanted to stay in Bellingham and I searched hard for a job and I got one that I love. But so many of my friends, they said, you know, I really want to live in Bellingham, but there's nothing I can do about that because I won't get a job. And they went straight down to Bellevue and straight down to Redmond and straight down to Seattle or San Francisco. Um, we have places here in Bellingham, such as Logos Bible Software, that hires a ton of people. We have Hagen. We have um, uh, Woods Coffee. And a lot of companies that aren't located in Bellingham itself, which I think Woods Coffee is Ferndale. Uh, Superfeet, which is a large, large company, is located in Ferndale. How do we attract companies to the caliper of Superfeet and um, those to be inside Bellingham, preferably downtown Bellingham. Looking at other um, giant places like Zodiac uh, Aerospace, how can that, instead of being way out um, off uh, bus route 331 near um, Barkley Village, which is more just Barkley parking lot, um, whether we can bring giant companies like that into uh, buildings downtown that currently are underutilized, like the building off State Street where uh, Dashy Noodles was in. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but from just looking at the outside, it looks like there's about four stories there of just empty space that probably hasn't been used for 20 years. That is what I want to see. I want to see more utilization of our current downtown, trying to, uh, within the current height limits, trying to encourage as much infill development, as much uh, uh, growth upward. So buildings like Bank of America that are single story end up growing upwards, especially before we start focusing on areas like uh, Barclay Village or um, the sprawl that is Meridian, or um, even the starlight gem of our uh, planning, which is, you know, the waterfront. Um, and I don't think that, I don't think that it's essential for us to look at uh, plowing through the waterfront and just expanding that area through that uh, land until we have a plan to address the underutilization of our current downtown. Because the amount of single story buildings and parking lots we have in our downtown um, really needs to be converted into usable space before we expand our downtown. If you want to make an area walkable, you aren't going to do that with um, broadening the area. Um, I think that cottages and co-housing are a great idea, what uh, you were mentioning before. People want single-family homes, I realize that, but 
We also can make apartments more attractive in many ways that we're not currently doing. Currently, lots of apartments being built. Wrap I'll up. finish up. But most apartments being built really reflect motels, um, whereas they could be reflecting uh, sort of community-oriented housing, housing that um, maybe it's three apartment uh, units in one, so like three A, B, and C, uh, all centered around, instead of parking, centered around uh, open space, whether that be a public park or a private backyard area. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Good evening, Commission members. My name is Perry Eskridge. I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Whatcom County Association of Realtors at 3317 Northwest Avenue. I want to just simply echo what um, Clayton and Darcy said earlier. Um, the, a lot of that information came from the National Association of Realtors Community Preference Survey, which was done in 2013. That's available if you just Google National Association of Realtors Community Preference Survey. You'll, you'll find it, and there's a whole myriad of, of um, information there to help you interpret that and see what's coming on. The takeaway from that is clearly what Clayton was pointing out, is that the planning objectives that you saw up on that screen are exactly flipped from what the preferences are that are being expressed by a whole cross-section of demographics. Um, and I wish to God that I could have picked you all up right now and taken you back to our government affairs meeting that occurred yesterday, and you would have seen this exact conversation being played out. The preference is still for detached single-family homes, and the question that was being asked by one of our agents yesterday to 12 of their colleagues was, can anybody please find me a high quality 800 square foot home in a walking distance of anything in Bellingham? I have clients who are ready to pay cash upwards of $500,000. We can't find it. There is a dearth of housing selections in Bellingham. If it's not single family detached, large home on a larger lot or a condo, it just simply doesn't exist. And we're running into that problem with our housing market here. Nobody's asking to live in a condo, I can promise you that. Ask Cerise. Um, I don't know when the last time was you sold a condo, but I don't think it was too recently. Maybe it was, I don't know. That's a, that's a loaded question. Um, when I'm looking at the alternatives that you're, you're being asked to consider, um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that finally the conversation is moving towards using our UGA. I'm not sure the political will is quite there yet to allow expansion out there, but if any planning department in the state can convince a council to do that, it would be this one, because I know they've got the talent in their office and the wherewithal to actually pull that off. I'm not sure the council members, though, have the, the um, gumption to actually follow the recommendations, though. Um, when, you, when you look at those results of legacies, healthful environment, drinking water, you know, all the, all the, the top three, of course, you know, and world peace. Um, but there was also that sense of place, and you're seeing it here tonight. Birchwood neighborhood, again, in our meeting yesterday, I made the suggestion that maybe the Birchwood neighborhood was a perfect place for redevelopment. And that was the response I got from the realtors who lived there, was take your redevelopment notion and go somewhere else. That is not what they want there. That is not what they want. And so we've got a real uphill battle here. They want the larger lots. Those, those are from the days of victory gardens out there. And that, that view is their sense of place, and they want it maintained while trying to still accommodate 34,000 people moving to the city of Bellingham. That is a Herculean task, and somewhere in the middle of it, is the balance that will work for everybody. So I would urge you, if you're going to go down this road, really look at those UGA options closely because I think that's actually your best bet. I've said it before in numerous public hearings, and I'll say it again here tonight just at the risk of being repetitive. The urban villages are a nice idea, but you really need to take a look at those and whether or not the market is going to support them. I always use Samish Way as a good example. Let's say I did actually want to do a development on Samish Way. 
who is going to go buy an existing McDonald's franchise that's turning a profit and pay the money that that is going to require? I mean, we're talking millions of dollars now, only to tear it down so that you can rebuild something on Samish. It's not going to happen. Those places are not amenable to large-scale developments that you're talking about to actually create an urban village. Same way when you get down to Old Town. Who is going to invest in 50 feet of infill, or not infill, but um, drilling down 50 feet to the bedrock through the fill that is a former city dump so that you can attempt to figure out how you're going to put underground parking in an area that has active environmental mitigation on it and build upwards of five or six stories to recoup all that infrastructure under the ground. It just simply doesn't pencil out. But let's say it did. Let's say you could do all of that and you did have all the money in the world and you could accomplish all of this stuff and the money was absolutely no object. Are you even going to be able to sell what it is you're building? And I think the answer to that question right now and for the foreseeable future is no. One of the things I've been handing out to both the county and the cities is please take a look at the FHA funding guidelines for condominium housing now. We all require ground level commercial, but that is now considered part of your rental portion of your condominium projects. If you have rentals over a certain number, I think it's around 40% right now, in a condominium project, you are ineligible for financing for people who want to buy a condo. So let's say they did want to buy a condo. Where do you get it financed? Right now I'm aware of one bank in Bellingham that will even look at a condo financing package. And that's because they can hold it in-house. They don't have to go sell it on the secondary market. They're not necessarily required to meet those lending guidelines. But the other guidelines are is you can't be within a mile of a railroad. Take a mile and draw it up the BN lines and tell me how many urban villages you hit. You also can't be within a mile of a major arterial street. We're saying we want all of these on major transportation corridors. You know, it's, I really encourage you as the planning commission that's gonna make a recommendation to the city council, please don't neglect the market realities of what is going to be driving whether or not people are purchasing the product that you're regulating into existence. If you ignore the market, if you ignore what people are asking for, if you're ignoring people's preferences and you just think you're gonna build it and they are going to come, I can tell you the answer is that they're not going to be able, you're not going to meet your objectives. Um, you know, I think I've hit all my points. So with that, I'll let it go. Thanks so much. If you have any Thanks, questions. Barry. I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. Good evening. My name is Dave Onkels. I live in Bellingham. Um, my comments are going to be pretty short. Um, one of the blogs that I follow is called newgeography.com. And a post last year, in, in actually in uh, March of this year, written by Wendell Cox, was called Urban Planning 101. And in it, he um, quotes L.A. Berthold, who used to be the chief planner for the World Bank, who argues that cities exist as labor markets. And they exist at the more efficient they function, as efficiently they function as a labor market, the more prosperous and, and vital they tend to be. I'll submit most of that column as a, as a written comment to the commission, but um, a quote that comes to mind from it is that urban villages exist only in the minds of planners. And this man is a planner himself. Um, a second comment is that the county's URMX zoning was mentioned by, by the planner, I believe, and the mix in URMX is 75% single family and 25% multifamily. The city typically turns that on its head. Um, and then my last comment is just an anecdote. Um, an acquaintance of mine is a part-time real estate developer 
who um, just received in an hour and 50 minutes preliminary plat approval for a 69 lot plat that's all single family at a, at a density of about four units per acre in a small city in, in Whatcom County. And so the small cities are gonna compete with growth for growth with Bellingham. And um, I don't think that Bellingham should feel that it's entitled to the growth because it's not going to come here unless Bellingham competes for it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Twitchell um, with the Building Industry Association, Whatcom County. And I could echo a number of things that have been said here. Um, one point being the, if you build it, they will come, is the approach the city has taken under the current comp plan and the uh, National Association of Home Builders surveys followed by the real estate survey Perry referred to both show that 70% or more of Americans want single family homes with some kind of yard, whether it's small or otherwise. But that does run contrary to the figures we've had. What the, the city's been planning for high rise urban villages instead of, and it's not what will happen if you do that. Look at what has happened over the last few years. People are building in Ferndale and Linden because that's where they can get what they want. So part of the question here is if you really want to maintain Bellingham as the urban center and encourage growth here instead of elsewhere, the, the typical description of sprawl, um, how can one do that? Um, I would encourage you to take a practical approach. One is involving some sort of demand analysis with these kinds of studies that show what people will buy. Uh, one involves financing, for instance, for uh, can, you, can you build these urban villages? I heard the comment yesterday uh, that from someone who has been involved in some downtown developments that they have to basically give away the commercial space on the bottom of these buildings that then would have residential above because the cost involved and the rent they can get makes it a, a, a no-go. So there's some very practical considerations here. If we're really gonna put you know, all of Bellingham's umph into urban villages, how are you, how's it gonna happen? On practical terms, I would encourage you please again to look at what areas we might be claiming as buildable land that are affected by wetlands or streams. I'm hoping that we've, we've winnowed that out already. But for instance, even the commercial area we have around the airport, look at the wetlands, lots and lots of wetlands impact out there. So it's, it's not just single family housing, which is my group's concern, but commercial as well. If you can't use the land, there's no point in claiming it. The waterfront is not going to be developed within the next 20 years. We should not be including any residential figures from the proposed waterfront redevelopment unless we actually intend to have that developed and in use within 20 years. Um, this is the type of thing that I'm, I'm hoping the planning department is, is taking into account, and I'm, I'm sure they are. Um, Greg and Sis, they're doing a great job, and I trust Greg, so anyway. But, but the practical end of things, please, the demand analysis. Is the land that we're claiming actually something we can use? I think expanding the UGAs and maybe getting rid of portions of the UGA that don't want to be involved is not a bad idea. Darcy had a good suggestion there because the whole point is how can we make it happen so you can actually meet these growth goals you want to meet? And if we're closing our eyes and saying, oh, well, it sounds good, that's not going to get us there, obviously. So um, let's see. The only other thing I would mention is that looking at what has happened in Seattle in terms of urban growth, uh, my suggestion would be people come to Bellingham because they don't want to live in Seattle. So uh, infill is is a good practical option. Um, I'm not saying, you know, the Birchwood neighborhood should be turned, forced to minimum density requirements or anything of that kind. But infill is a good option. And when you look at who's coming, if we're talking about retired people, a lot of folks would love to be able to use the infill toolkit to come up with cottage housing, et cetera, where you might have shared 
gardens or yards, you might be able to have shared storage space in smaller homes, smaller lots, so to speak. Right now, that's only allowed in multi-zones. I think expanding that into the option of using single family areas if folks want to do that is not a bad idea. Another infill thought is we have a lot of neighborhood folks who say, please not in my backyard. I mean, it happens every time a proposal comes up. Maybe we can require the use, allow the use of infill or the infill toolkit on edges of neighborhoods. I mean, you know, especially where you've got large streets and you have the, the transportation uh, services there to accommodate a little more dense single family ish stuff. So, those are, are things we might consider that haven't been taken up in great sincerity up to this point, and I hope you'll consider them. Thank you much. Thank you, Linda. Hi, my name is April Barker. Uh, I live in the Birchwood neighborhood, 3127 Birchwood Avenue. I'm also um, the president of the Birchwood neighborhood, and I serve as the chair on a, a committee called the the BIAC. It's um, a way that the port is looking to get more community input uh, with the airport. The, the reason why I ever got involved with the airport, I never thought I would, is we purchased our home in 2008. At that time, the port had a master plan out till 2050 that showed they would never go more than 300,000 emplanements. We were kind of near that number when we bought our house, so we thought that, well, if that's as big as they're going to grow, this is going to be a good uh, purchase for our family. So we purchased, and uh, over, over the years, we started really noticing that there was a lot of changes going on. Like we were inside our house, and the doors were closed, and the windows were closed, and you had to stop talking because there was an airplane coming over top of you. Or you were out in your yard, and you literally had to stop talking because you could keep talking, but nobody could hear you anymore. Um, so it, it really started to impact us more, and I went to go look at the figures, and I found out, wow, we, we've already surpassed what they said we were going to surpass in 2050, and therefore there's an updated master plan, and, and that process is underway. So we're, we're now, at 2013, we nearly reached 600,000 employments, and I'd really like you guys to understand <laughs> that all these people that were living there we're expecting one thing, they're getting another, and the desirability is going to be really important to maintain if we're looking at now the future growth plan is going toward a million employments. So if I'm, I'm starting to think about my property at 600,000, what's going to happen to all those properties including Alderwood um, where two of your situations look like you were thinking about uh, moving out and into. I really, if you look at that picture, you guys all have it in front of you, the size of the airport just showing just showing its runways is bigger than your UGAs. But yet we're putting ideas of houses right next to it and on top of it. Now, the FAA requires this contour of 65 decibels. They've just decided that. They can't afford to pay everybody for what's happening outside there. But there's people like me. I don't live anywhere near that contour. But I can tell you I was woken up the other night with uh, four touch and goes at 10 o'clock at night. It's perfectly legal and it's going to happen more, and these are the people that are going to be impacted. So why do we stay? I can walk to the beach, I can get on my bike, and I can have, I can like feed my family practically six months out of the year just on our property. So there's things that are outweighing the mess of the airport coming overhead, and of course I'm thinking, literally we have the talk every half year, okay, do we still want to do this, or should we sell when it's still valuable? So um, I think it begs to offer we need to ask the question, who's going to want to live there if you, if you infill? And I think we all know what the answer is. We're going to have another monoculture of people who don't get to live at the top of the hill. And at a, a debate for the airport, we had all the commissioners there that were running. And one of the commissioners said, my mom, when we were talking about all oh, this, you know, this is really impacting us. We didn't expect it. And he said, my mom always told me never to buy at the bottom of a hill. Well, there's some of us that have to buy at the bottom of the hill. And I think it's really important that the city of Bellingham realize that and don't make those areas undesirable or push the population just because that's all they can afford. We deserve better than that. We're smarter than that. We're an extremely smart community. We get all kinds of amazing people here, and I really hope you guys utilize that and think about what you're doing instead of just putting it there. Thank you. 
Thanks, April. David McLeod, 3215 Cherrywood Avenue. Seems Birchwood is pretty well represented here tonight. Um, I think that uh, you know the year 2036 is not going to be like the year 2014, and uh, we need to really be creative and flexible in how we do our planning. And part of that planning is to plan for unexpected things. Um, I think uh, we need some large lots for the people that want to grow food, have their victory gardens. We need to find places for infill. Uh, we need to be creative like, uh, as Clayton had mentioned, the tiny houses. I think that really needs to be looked into. You know, what kind of regulations um, can be done to make those attractive to people and to make them work in the city of Bellingham, the cottage houses, um, accessory dwelling units, mother-in-law apartments, all of these things need to be looked at and um, we need to be flexible with the individual neighborhoods and, and the people in them and what their needs are. And finally, I'll just uh, remind you of the um, statement I made at the beginning of the meeting about the ERSPO report from 2009. Um, energy security is a real issue and it's going to be affecting us all in 2036. Thanks. Yeah, good evening, Cal Leinstra, 514 South State <clears throat> in Fairhaven. Uh, pretty much everything has been said, what I had in my notes, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what Clayton had said and, and Perry pretty much covered that also and Linda. But um, as a real estate guy that's been in the business for 40 some odd years, um, I think that uh, the condos and the apartments is not what people are looking for. They're definitely looking for single family housing and they'll drive as far as they have to till they can afford it. And that means Nooksack and Blaine and Ferndale North and every place but Bellingham. I think it's been mentioned three or four times about the uh, flipping of the equation here where Bellingham was taking 62% before until 2002 and now they're into the 30% and maybe even 25% and some have suggested with infill calculations maybe more like 18 or 19% so that that's just not working and uh, regarding other properties uh, Darcy mentioned I had to count them up a thousand ninety acres of people that do not want to be in the UGA for one reason or another Dewey Valley East U Street and others just don't want to be in the UGA. We, we can't count those as uh, land supply and, and do it credibly. The other thing is the um, wetlands and critical areas. I don't think they've done a real definitive analysis of how much land that is really taking up. And um, also there's been a recent, um, I think some of the capacity may have included Padden Hills. That deal did not go together the 100 acre wood is not going to be uh, supporting the density that people had proposed and planned. There's the waterfront, and someone I mentioned maybe 20 years, that might be a pretty accurate uh, presentation. So, and urban villages, I mean, where is one? A Barclay Village is not really an urban village, it's, uh, it's a retail area with an apartment uh, building. So, uh, there's nobody developing uh, urban villages. You can't get financing, and as Perry mentioned, Old Town's pretty tough because of uh, geological considerations, among other things. So we need to really consider the uh, urban growth area and our property, um, which is in that South UGA of South U Street. We, I'm a partner in, had the opportunity to make payments on that for about 15 years now. Haven't done anything with it, been an applicant most of the time. But anyway, it, it, at one time we did have a preliminary plat approval and that area is surrounded by urban uh, infrastructure and urban housing. It's got the, one of the biggest parks in town is Patton. Not only that, but adjoining our property is a 26 acre park and just north of that is a 10 acre park that the city already owns. And to the west of our property is a four or five million dollar uh, Wade King Elementary School which was built there on the premise that that's where the growth would occur. 
they're busing people to that school when they shouldn't have to be doing that. People talk about walkability. This property is right adjacent to the school property. They've got their troubles too as far as uh, capacity and water and, and uh, uh, protection that way, which really you should take a, a good look at. So we're anxious to have uh, South U Street, uh, which is now in the reserve and was in the urban service area in the 1980s and was one of the first properties in 1997 in the urban growth area. And we're still astonished that it's not there now. But I just wanted to hand out uh, a little map so you don't. One time I think we missed <laughs> getting this into the uh, city and you know, because one of the county council members got confused with where the property was. And I don't want that to happen again, so I hope you won't mind and be too forward if I give you a map that shows where that 100 acres is. And uh, I hope we can uh, get something like that back into the uh, UGA. Thank you. Thanks, Cal. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? If not, we'll close the public portion of the hearing and staff, your responses. I just have a couple of things. Um, I want to make clear this is the beginning of what will most assuredly be a lively discussion. Um, that we'll be having over the next six months or so. Um, we'll be coming back to the Planning Commission in the springtime after the uh, environmental work has been done, after some additional wetland study in the north has been done, and we'll be asking you at that time to make recommendations on um, sort of where and how we're going to grow to the City Council. Uh, also in the spring, Council will make the final decision, policy decisions about that issue. Uh, all options are on the table at this point. We haven't ruled anything out. Um, we're looking at infill. We're looking at uh, areas in, that are already in the UGA. Are they uh, suitable for higher density or not? Uh, we don't have the answers to those questions yet. And we're looking at uh, areas immediately outside of the UGA to see if those are suitable for urban development, like the South U Street area. So. Um, all options are on the table, and um, we're doing the analysis work that we hope will provide you folks and the council with the information that you need to make informed decisions about this, you know, where and how we're going to grow over the next 20-some years. Um, so we're happy to uh, answer any questions you have or just talk about the issues. Like I said, this is the beginning of a fairly lengthy discussion that we'll be having. I would also say that um, Dewey Valley was mentioned a couple of times and how you know development will never happen in Dewey Valley and they don't want to be in the city. We actually have an annexation petition in for 150 acres of the Dewey Valley UGA. They want to be in the city. So sometimes you never know um, about what's going to happen in the future. That's it from staff. I, I wanted to make a comment. Uh, the slide that we had up in our presentation regarding housing preferences, um, that was based on um, a report from Burke Consulting, who's doing consulting work um, with the county and the cities in the county on the EIS. And they did their own economic, demographic, and housing trend study for Whatcom County and, and the cities. And that's what they found, that although there will be strong demand for single-family housing in the area, the trends indicate steady demand for multifamily housing in Bellingham. So I would urge you to take a look at that report as well, and to, in addition to the other ones that you were presented with tonight. Thank you. Ali, you had your... I have a question for Greg. <clears throat> um, we, we're going to make a recommendation in the spring is the plan to have like some work sessions dedicated to the topic or are we just going to fit this in as we go along because i know like we have other topics that are going to be primary topics for meetings and i mm -hmm. i'm kind of curious how much time we all get together to talk about this so that i can like uh decide what questions to ask now basically we'll have as many work sessions as you need to feel comfortable making a recommendation 
the plan is to at least have some opportunities for us to come back and talk, you know, like say post questions now, then give you time to come up with responses, come back to us, discuss it further. Okay. I, I had one other question specifically related to that slide that I wouldn't mind asking since it's, you just brought it up. You're talking about the slide where uh, Chris referenced de there is a definite demand for multifamily housing. And my question is, it, has any, is there a demand for single family housing? Because we didn't, we just kind of didn't talk about that. I mean, did, did they determine in that study if there's also a high demand for for single family housing? I know rental rates are really high and occupancy is really low, but I also know that what the real estate agents are telling us is true, that houses go off the market immediately and there's not a lot of single family either. So I'm curious if there was any feedback from the consultants on single family demand. We can send the report out to you okay. if that would be helpful. Yeah. I, I mean, my takeaway from that was that, yes, there is demand for single yeah. family, but they sort of singled Bellingham out <laughs> from the other cities in the county for having more multifamily demand due to our demographics, mm -hmm. students, seniors, retirees, et cetera. So that was a countywide study, effectively. Yeah, OK. Thanks. Steve. It looks like we've got diametrically opposed opinions here. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm concerned about that. Um, the last, what, two, three, four years, we've had a lot of activity, uh, you know, padding trails. We've had, uh, what about Chuckanut Ridge? We had Sunnyland. Every time someone tries to move forward with some kind of a multifamily development, the neighborhoods come in force about character and are absolutely opposed to that kind of development in their specific neighborhoods. So when I see the demand or what we have to satisfy more in the multifamily areas, I get very concerned as to how we are going to do this. Everyone that's come up in those last three I suggested, well, the Sunnyvale one is still pending. Everything that comes up multifamily, I mean, it just it just raises the, the concerns of the neighborhood. And I can see definitely the virtues of the small cottages. I can see the, the, the Birchwood neighborhoods, the character. I, I drove Birchwood a couple days ago, the entire thing. And uh, I couldn't believe how big and deep some of those lots are. You know, that's, that's quite a deal. I, when I moved out here, I gave away my riding lawnmower, and uh, I don't want anything to do with those things anymore. But that's just me. But, you know, 30 years ago, give me a, a hoe and an axe, and I, I was ready to go. Uh, I think that we really got to look at some of the, the premises in this whole study, how they, what we're, what we're asked to go by. Uh, I see in one alternative, we've got the single family housing just adjacent I-5 next to the airport. Uh, and, and hearing uh, Ms. Barker talk, and, and I've heard some people out in the county come to me and say the noise is unbearable. Hopefully, uh, Legion will get rid of some of those MD-80s one of these days <laughs> and get a little better aircraft in there. But uh, they're noisy. They're very definitely noisy. I hear them. Uh, near uh, the Guide Meridian taking off and r running up. So I, I just, I don't know how we're going to rectify these, this number thing, but I'm very concerned about it, about the, the amount of multifamily and that how we're going we're gonna to satisfy our task uh, along with the, the Growth Management Act the neighborhoods, what happens in a neighborhood when they turn down a project? They've already been assigned so many infills. How do they make it up? What do they do? Slide it over to the neighborhood next to them and say, you guys pick up the slack. We, we don't want it here. So I, th there's a ton of problems here. And I know that uh, Commissioner Thomas is very concerned about the infill kid. I, I'm sorry he couldn't make it tonight. But a ton of questions. There's a ton of questions out there. and I. We might need a lot of those work, work sessions because uh, the more you look at it, uh, the more questions I seem to come up with. And, and I support what Allie said. I, I think that uh, 
We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you. Now we'll just strap on our superhuman outfits and, and <laughs> do it. Uh, <laughs> question I have of staff is, is anything further in our um, uh, work sessions going to involve educational um, components for us? I mean, I feel like just having us talk about things is, I got so much from listening to what the people had to say today, and I'll probably seek some of them out and, and have conversations with them to get in some in-depth uh, comments just for my own gratification. But are we looking at something, when you say work sessions, is it just us talking, or are you looking at people who will present for us? In, I, I think the unexpected consequences, pushing single family out toward the airport, where we're already having problems. I mean, I'm just looking at so many issues that I come up with just with tonight, and that's not with giving it a great deal of thought. Um, yes, we will have information for you. We'll have an entire environmental impact statement that will look at some of these issues. If there are specific topics that you would like to devote time to, let us know. We can arrange to do that. Um, yeah, so the answer is yes. Thank you. Garrett? I just, I just have one question for, I guess, staff clarification in general that a lot of things are coming up about infill. All three of the alternatives talk about infill in existing neighborhoods, and I think it's important to define what that is and what that means, because automatically the assumption is there'll be no more 20,000 square foot lots. And I don't think that we can do a land analysis review and assume that rezones are going to happen in neighborhoods that are going to go from 20,000 to 10,000. So I think it's important for staff to clear that up for the people who have concerns about what infill means. Um, go ahead. So I, I, I heard that from several people that commented and just, just to clear up what the land capacity analysis is that that the numbers we presented to you tonight is based on the there's the 35,900 and some population forecast that we're trying to accommodate and um, as we showed on the slides we have uh, capacity based on our analysis for about 32,000 uh, people housing units to accommodate 32,000 that capacity is based on today's zoning yeah. That's that's not assuming rezones. That's assuming um, existing current zone. master planned urban growth areas, existing zoning for single family and or multifamily in today's neighborhoods and in the unincorporated urban growth area. And for the unincorporated urban growth area and for some of the recently annexed areas with the either existing URMX or areas that were formerly zoned URMX, like I had said before, that assumes the low end of the density spectrum for those because that's historically what we've seen in those areas because people have not taken advantage of or been able to take advantage of density bonus programs and TDRs. So if it's a six to 10 zone, we assume six. That also assumes the full spectrum of reductions for critical areas and their buffers um, based on our best available layers that we have in our mapping system, which includes a lot of um, actual delineations or um, reconnaissance level surveys and in kind of the last resort is the the federal NWI survey which is old and inaccurate for um, wetlands for wetlands but in most cases it's based on delineation level data or reconnaissance survey data from local consultants so so I guess what I'm stressing is we're not proposing based on that 32,000 capacity number rezones it would be what we're trying to figure out is that extra 2,000 housing units how do we get there? So it's that extra percentage to meet the 35,900 number. Um, and that, those are the, the additional suggestions we pose to you tonight, which again are just conversation starters more than anything at this point, looking at something higher than the minimum density in the UGA, either a mid-range or some other combination, right. looking at those four additional urban village areas that were identified in the three of them in the 2006 comp plan and then the, the James Street corridor is in a fourth one. Um, and then other, uh, one other one that was, uh, that Lisa mentioned that was on the map was also the idea of looking at uh, the high, high intensity transit corridors or the, the go along the go lines, looking at potential incentives along those corridors. Uh, 
So I, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's an important distinction to make is when you're talking about infill, it's within the current zoning. So there's no proposal to change any zoning, shrink anybody's lot. Uh, it's simply undeveloped or underdeveloped land supply that is zoned what it is. Uh, so I just, I guess I had a question on, on how we're coming at these numbers when I look at like alternative number one, infill and existing city limits. So at the beginning of your presentation, Chris, you'd mentioned that the planning forecast assumes the full annexation of all the UGAs. Is that, so if we're talking about alternative, alternative number one, that's not expanding or taking into account any of the UGA, is that correct? Actually, it, it, it's a bit of a, it, it does assume growth in the UGA, but what, what it looks, what we're looking at, uh, the reason we're talking about uh, in alternative one, highlighting the city is that the changes we're proposing to get to that extra 2,000 housing unit total would be within the, within the confines of the city for that alternative. We'd be looking at the, um, the additional urban goal or urban village areas and then potentially the transit corridors. And then the uh, second alternative is looking at those, something like a, something higher than the minimum density in the uh, recently annexed or the, the yet to be annexed areas. So they're kind of, it's, for purposes of illustration here, it's, it's probably a bit confusing looking at them as separate pieces. We're really looking at them as, as menu alternatives and that you would be choosing from amongst them and, and probably not just isolating one by itself because I don't think any one by itself is going to solve the problem. Right. So, the, so to be clear, the assumption is that the full development of all the existing UGAs, those housing units are counted into the 18,000 that we want to accommodate in the next 20 years. Right, we're, we're counting the land capacity. When I say land capacity analysis, that includes the entire UGA. We're, we're assuming that- Fully developed. That we have, yeah, that, that the entire Annexed. UGA. Uh, most of the areas, yeah, they, they would, to, to be able to get to Annexed. even the minimum density, they need utilities. And so in, in those cases, they would, they would need to be annexed in a lot of cases unless there's an existing utility service zone or, um, you know, but, right. but it's, yeah, for the most part, they would need to be annexed before they could do something more than what they've got today. I'll let somebody else ask some questions. Cerise. Uh, just a few things, just to piggyback on what you're asking. So when you said all options are on the table and that this is like a menu thing, we could mix and match all of these. It's not pick one, two, or three. Uh, right, okay, thank you. Um, also, I guess um, I'd like to say thank you to you staff and thank you to everyone that's here. I feel like it was very helpful and um, it really shows how much people care about their community and you know I think we can all acknowledge that there's a need for housing you know that was everyone's in agreement I, I find it kind of interesting and ironic that um, the people that are the neighborhood that's speaking is the neighborhood who has single-family homes with land so I think that shows you the demand there's a supply and demand that's what people want so you know we have that's that's a good point was brought up people aren't looking for condos they're looking for single family houses with land so um you know i i think we can see what people want and um i think we can accommodate it in lots of ways also i i feel like um the gentleman that talked from western i think his name's david isaac isaac, isaac. um you know, being smart and creative about how we solve these problems is so important. And I feel like there's a lot of different opportunities at, um, how to solve these problems. Um, so I'm excited to work with all of you guys too in doing that, that, and all of you, that we can together solve these problems because it's, you know, I don't think anyone wants to live in an, another apartment building, but someone might like a little small house with a backyard next to somebody else you know there there's a lot of ways to come at this and um so i i'm just really encouraged by everything i've heard this evening and um i, I have more to say but i just want to say that that i i'm really thankful and appreciative to um everything that i've heard this evening if, if all options are on the table has staff looked at the opportunity for houseboats or dirig dir dirigibles <laughs> <laughs> All options. Um, Lisa, I think when you started, you said that, that 
um, this is not going to be a major overhaul of the comp plan. But if we're looking at the comp plan and we're not going to overhaul it, when would be the time for a major overhaul of the comp plan? I think what we mean when we say it's not an overhaul is that it, we're not conducting a large visioning process to reframe the issues and extensive public engagement. So Greg might be able to follow up on that. I think we're, we are assuming that the, the bones of the plan, the basic policy direction in the current plan is going to continue. Um, and that's what we mean by we're not going to overhaul it. We're not going to start over with a completely new plan, a new vision, a new direction. We think the current plan has served us well. It needs to be updated. Um, but the bones of it, the, the basic goals and policies, the vision that was established is, is applicable today as it was in 2006 when the plan was adopted. Okay. So if I had a nightmare last night and I got a brand new vision, you'd just kick me out the door? Yes. Okay. No, absolutely not. If you have a great idea, Tom, we are all ears. I said a nightmare, not a great idea. <laughs> Carrot. Uh, uh, just uh, with the options being on the table, so so there's been some mention of uh, redefining or re redrawing the borders of the UGA. What what mechanism is there to do that? Is that something that we can entertain during this process? How would, what would that look like? Yeah, we'll be looking at these existing UGA areas to see if it's appropriate to keep them. Um, looking at the the circumstances, can we serve those areas with? all of the facilities that are needed. Can we get fire trucks there in time? Uh, are the roads going to be adequate? How much will we have to spend to upgrade facilities? We'll be doing all of that analysis, and it may very well be that some areas that are in, currently in our urban growth area fall out, and other areas that are more attractive, that, are, that, are, that have more development capacity, that are easier to serve, might be added. So that'll be part of the analysis, yes. Is that something that goes through in our city council, goes to the comp plan amendment, uh, city council votes on it, that's done? Does it have to interface with the county? Yeah, no, the urban growth boundary is set by the county, so we make recommendations. It was just a council would make, we'd make a recommendation, council would make a recommendation, and then the final decision would be at the county level. Uh, just to make sure I understand this completely, what Garrett was talking about earlier regarding the maps, would it, would it be fair to just take all, this first map with all the colored areas and really put that on every alternative? And, and that's, that's the same in all three alternatives. The only difference would be, like for example, on the first alternative we'd have these green dots for the urban villages, and on the second one we'd have these increased density would, does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, I see where you're going with that. You, you can think of it that way. So, yeah, so in, in all scenarios, we're doing all of these things on the first page, plus whatever, kind of, except maybe the urban villages. I, I think except the urban villages, yeah. and then potentially the, um, the high-frequency transit corridor incentives. Yeah. But certainly the background landscape of vacant land, um, you know, the uh, like we talked about, well, the, you, you know, in, in every neighborhood there are you know, individual or small groups of vacant lots, yeah. um, some more so than others. Um, and, and that's going to be present in every alternative because, you know, those folks have a right to develop their land and, uh, you know, we have no way of controlling that. So that's just, I mean, the zoning is, we're not proposing different zoning in each one of these alternatives. The only variation would be, well, do we need to add something to the mix like ur additional urban village master plan areas or transit corridor incentives or do we need to grow the UGA in particular areas or reconfigure it? Um, those kinds of questions. Um, so I understand what you were explaining about um, how you calculated, say, our master planned areas where we have established like a, a density or, or plan for that or our, um, like, like the King Mountain neighborhood where you can say, okay, it's six to ten, we're going to take six and we're going to discount a percentage of that land for critical areas or something like that. How does that apply in these yellow, in the single family, which which looks in a lot of instances, especially in the south side, where it's like lot and block infill <coughs> of vacant lots, not infill like changing zoning, but there's a vacant lot on a block, we're going to build a house on it. 
did you guys do any discounting for that, for so, the single family element? So if it's a, a vacant lot in an existing plat, a vacant lot in South Hill, for instance, or Happy Valley, or, or any of those neighborhoods where it's part of an existing plat, there's no, there's no deduction for infrastructure because it's already had that done in the platting process. There's sure. already existing right of way. There's already utility easements, you know, uh, open space corridors, all that kind of thing is already in existence. So that's just a one for one. That's you can put a, you can put a housing unit there. Um, if you're looking at um, a larger a larger piece of land, uh, a 10 acre parcel in a zone that supports 5,000 square foot lots, um, then you know we would take the size of the parcel, divide it by that density, and figure out, oh, they can accommodate you know X number of lots on paper. Mm -hmm. And then you do the deductions for, well, are there wetlands and buffers on the property? Um, you know, and then we have a percentage for infrastructure because if it's a 10 acre lot, and they're subdividing it, there's a percentage that's gonna be needed for roads so they can mm -hmm. access the houses. So we have the, the county's land capacity analysis has a whole set of factors in there where they've communicated over the last several times we've done this model, um, the last time being 2009, when the, the model has been tweaked incrementally since then with feedback from the different cities, but it's essentially, it's very similar. Um, there were reduction percentages for all of those different kinds of things in, and, and again, separate ones for multifamily versus single family because they're, they're different forms and behave differently. And then, and then what you're left with is the actual, what, what our best guess is, is what the development capacity would be for housing units. And then they take that and say, okay, well, if it's single family, it gets a particular multiplier for vacancy rates and a particular multiplier for how many persons per household they're estimating would be in there to get to a population number. And, and you're going into that detail of looking at these areas, for example, saying that's, a, that's an individual lot, an old plat, and, and getting down to that detail? Exactly, okay. yeah, it's a and parcel by parcel analysis. I was reviewing the, the draft methodology that the Kent County has adopted from May of this year. That's what you're talking about that you, that you just described? That's right. The, That's the, the, the methodology that the counties said everyone should use. Right. So actually, they're the ones that actually have run that. So we provide them, each city has provided them with our best available GIS mapping information, coding the parcels, whether they're, they're vacant, partially vacant, redevelopable, or fully developed. Mm -hmm. And then they take that information, and, and we also provide them with what our code indicates zone by zone are the appropriate densities based on what's in our zoning code. And we give them our critical areas information with the appropriate buffers, and then they run that all countywide in a single model. And, gotcha. and then that gets dumped into spreadsheets, and they run statistics Do you jurisdiction I mean, by jurisdiction. You're, to a certain degree, you're giving the, a little bit of the control over that end product over to them. Do you feel pretty confident that the, their methodology and them running that actually produces real numbers for Bellingham? Because I know in the past there's been some debate. I mean, I participated in the 2009 process, and there's some debate about, like, whether or not the county's approach is right for Bellingham, and it seems like you might be the best person to opine on that. We've, we've carefully looked at the results and ran the same, basically the same methodology in-house, um, not across the whole county, but in different areas of, of the Bellingham, you know, the, our part of the model, so to speak. And I'm, I'm reasonably confident that they're running it that, that they're following a methodology that all the different jurisdictions have agreed upon. So I, I'm, I'm, I think that's it's the best, we, the best we can get, I guess, out of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't have any really large reservations about that. There, there are, um, you know, uh, minor issues that we've gone that every jurisdiction has gone back and forth with on on what is the right buffer width and what is the appropriate. Um, like like what we do in the UGA, you know, we Bellingham has chosen to go with the lower end of the density range. Um, I think we're the only place in the county that's got URMX zoning in the urban growth area, but other cities have their own particular issues with their own urban growth areas or even internal zoning. Um, and there's been a, a dialogue back and forth, you know, for over a year uh, before the model was kind of cemented as as the county seek you know, sought input from the different planners and, and analysts in each jurisdiction. And, and it was a real, you know, it was a process. So I think where we're at right now, you know, most people are happy with most of the model um, from, a, from a staff point of view. Okay. One more quick clarification question on the methodology, and then I'll get off that topic. But, it, d I, and you, I probably could read through that more carefully and figure this out, but is there a safety factor built into that for just people who don't want to build? There's, it's called a market factor. Yeah, so market there's factor. A, for um, vacant land, it's 15%. Um, so just like if you just have a, a completely vacant five-acre lot and you want to subdivide it into 5,000 square foot lots, 
then 15% of that would be taken off the top. Um, again, uh, individual lot by individual lot, that is less relevant, but when you look at you know, thousands of lots across a dozen neighborhoods or so, then that percentage makes sense. So there's 15% we assume during the 20 year period, no one, nothing's gonna happen with it because of owner decisions or you know, whatever financing limitations, whatever you wanna call it, could be anything. Um, for partially developed and for redevelopable land, those numbers go up, so it goes up to 25% for residential for those, um, just because, you know, for, you might have a, a large side yard, but there could be other challenges, like, you know, something as simple as fitting a driveway in, or, or maybe it's an angled piece of property and setbacks to the neighbor's home prohibit you getting too close, or, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah. There's, there, so that jumps up to 25% for anything other than a vacant piece of property. Okay, thanks, mm -hmm. appreciate that. Okay, Garen. Is there is there any Chris this for is there any way that we could see the data on existing land supply for single family versus multifamily within the city limits? Like what you've depicted on this map, the yellow areas are are the development infill capacity for single family. I mean, can we see actual numbers in housing units? Like we project that there's, you know, three thousand single family housing units within the city limits. We can provide that, yes. And then, and then also within the UGAs, because uh, there's a lot of talk about what, U, what UGAs are appropriate to be in a UGA. We would need the numbers for that. And we can, we can do that as well. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Any more discussion? Can we ask some questions or some things for them to bring back to us? Absolutely. Is that okay? Yeah. I have a couple things I'd like to try and get more feedback on. I actually was going to ask the exact question Garrett asked. It'd be great to see, like, we have 35,000. We, we're saying we can get hit 32 with this map here on alternative one effectively if you took the U urban village proposals out. It'd be great to see how that breaks out. Urban village area, you know, how much the pink can accommodate, how much the yellow can accommodate. I think that'll help us visualize these numbers we're talking about, 70%, 20%, you know, that would be helpful. Um, and I, we have an existing strategy in our comp plan in the 2006 plan. I was reading it today and it talks about basically using infill in our neighborhoods and developing urban villages and annexing our UGAs. Those are like the, th it basically says we're gonna do all three. That's our plan right now. And it sounds like some combination of that is uh, what might be the most appropriate answer because I really I, I think Steve really summed it up well We've got some really interesting comments from the public tonight about What people want and how that you know juxtaposes against these alternatives I'd like to know what staff thinks about the effectiveness of those three policies To date, you know, I'd be really curious what staff thinks about how our infill efforts have gone and what results we've gotten and how our urban village plans have gone and what results we've gotten and also the UGA expansions we've we've had because I mean it you know we can talk all day about what we'd like but it'd be great to know what's worked so far uh, from our existing strategies um, so I'd appreciate some feedback from from you guys on that next time um, and you know not numbers but just like how you guys feel about those things and what you guys have seen in the in the long-range planning process um, and that's it for now Cerise. Um, I'd also be interested in um, the process or how we can go forward on, for instance, this map that Cal brought us that, you know, there's developers and owners that are ready, willing, and able to move forward and um, how we can uh, forward that process. What is that process and how can we um, move forward with people who want to do this? That makes sense. Okay. Sorry, Phyllis. Uh, one question I have is that uh, UGA growth uh, to the northwest up by the airport. If we didn't include that, if we decided to back off putting uh, how additional housing out that way, it seems like we're getting all over ourselves with conflicting uses. What impact would that have? Uh, what are the positive and, and negative uh, impacts on uh, whether that UGA would, would even be considered 
I know it's a, it looks like a large portion of what we have on the maps right now. Is that a smart thing to do? I don't know. I think I'd, I'd love to have some information on that. Holly? I thought of one more thing that we completely didn't talk about, which was our uh, uh, job supply. I mean, this whole discussion's been about residential housing, and we haven't talked about the numbers on the jobs. So there's 20 some odd thousand jobs, and I'm curious if if we're short on that. Have you guys analyzed, you know, how much land we have for jobs, and if we're short on that at all? Is if is that happened, or is that part of the plan? It's it, yeah. It's 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 been. There's been equal attention paid to both. So the, okay. the Burke report, the, you know, we had a forecast for both. Sure. The land capacity model looks at both forecast capacity or looks at capacity for both, both housing and for jobs. Um, we're, we're much closer on the employment front. We I'll also okay. just say the employment models, uh, housing is a very, uh, I guess, you know, despite everything we've talked about tonight, housing is a very predictable thing to model compared to employment. Um, just if you can just imagine a, a thousand square feet of of employment space in a finished building, and is it a is it a cubicle-based call center, or are they you know is it an R and D lab with four people in it? Um, I, tenant improvements, you know, we, we get those all the time in buildings. The, the character inside of the building envelopes we have in our in our urban areas changes annually, drastically. So, um, but based on that being said, you know, we've picked numbers that we think are relatively. Uh, uh, standard for jobs per square feet for retail, for office commercial, and for industrial, um, and for institutional employment. And based on those numbers that we've picked, we're we're close. Um, you know, maybe in the nature of you know around a thousand jobs or so, one way or the other, depending on how you slice it. Um, so we're nowhere near the kind of deficit we're looking at. Um, again, based on the model um, that we are for housing. It, that made me think of something else too. Um, to talk about the incentives that we can do for downtown, for instance, um, with all the vacant space that's just sitting there, um, not being used. So, just incentives in general, what those look like, so we can find out how we could talk about what would incentivize people to um, create housing or jobs downtown or just period. Um, and then I guess on the flip side of that, what happens when a property owner downtown, for instance, doesn't do anything with their property for 20 years and it affects our whole downtown? Uh, I'd be very curious on what the consequence is too. Um, so, you know, good parent, you know, do you, do you give a treat for something or do you, you know, punish? And I'm, I'd prefer to, you know, give a treat, but we've been giving treats for a long time and I don't think it's helping us. So I'd be very curious, you know, how we need to move forward to get our downtown thriving. And, and that not just downtown, um, is, is there consideration for um, expansion of industrial um, zone? Um, you know, retail doesn't pay a whole lot. When GP left, they, it, you know, 500 pretty good paying jobs went right down the toilet. And nothing has come back in Bellingham to, uh, to replace that. And, and as was brought up, um, cities are, you know, labor markets. They develop because of labor. So, Ali. I I, I agree with what Tom's saying, and I, I brought that up because even if I wanted to know how the numbers looked, but I think that discussion of jobs is really integral to the housing element. They're one and the same because we won't get good companies coming here to open businesses if our housing isn't appropriate to serve those people. And one of the young gentlemen who talked about staying in Bellingham, that's a real concern I have. Um, I grew up here, and I feel lucky to have found a good job in the community. And, you know, if we don't, if we're not careful about the opportunities we provide in housing, we won't get the jobs. And I, I want to read one statement from the comp plan, which is in the land use chapter. And it says, it's in the background discussion, and it says, inherent in this land use section is the recognition that the goals outlined 
envisions for Bellingham cannot be achieved absent a healthy economy. It is also recognized that a healthy economy requires a supply of residential, commercial, and industrial sites sufficient to meet the community's needs and to provide choices in the marketplace over time. And I just want to say that because we really have to think about that holistically and you know, our comp plan tells us to do that. And it's not so simple as saying we want multifamily, we want single family. We want the housing that will get the people here uh, or that, it, that will be able to be purchased by the people who have jobs here at the pay that they're getting here. So it's, it's all integral and I, I, I'm glad you brought it up, Cerise, because I think it's important for us to talk about some of this stuff. Anything? Oh. I just keep looking at my notes and I keep seeing things that I want to talk about. And I know we're going to talk more about this, but um, it was brought up a lot tonight about sidewalks and, and lighting in neighborhoods. So I think the neighborhoods that we do have, we need to make them really great too. And I know when personally, when I'm looking at um, neighborhoods, sidewalks is something I look, I like walking. Walkability is very important to me. Um, and I know as being a real estate agent and selling people homes or helping people buy homes, um, that's what they're looking for too. You know, they want to build to. So I think quality of life for the neighborhoods we do have, we need to look at how we can improve them um, so that people want to live there too. Uh, so I don't know how that, how we want to factor that in, but I just, it was brought up a lot tonight and I know it's important. So I just want to touch on that too. Uh, just on that topic, the, since the 2006 comp plan, in fact, just within the last year and a half, the city has, uh, council has adopted both the, um, or approved both the pedestrian master plan and the bicycle master plan, bicycle master plan just about a month ago. And so with this update, both of those will be folded into the transportation chapter. So that'll be part of the process. Thank you. Any other discussion tonight? If not, we'll close the public meeting. Um, any old or new business? No. Director's report? No. Yes? Maybe. Can we carry something over from last meeting for decision tonight? No? No. Okay. What other meetings? We have another meeting in December, right? And what, what is on that agenda? Help me remember. Subdivision ordinance. Up, subdivision ordinance. Update on the subdivision ordinance. That'll yeah. be fun, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing else? Should we be expected to be talking about this topic at that next meeting too? Or are we just no, going to focus? No. That meeting needs to be focused on subdivision. Okay. Thank you. Nothing else? Okay. Well, then we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you.